what we're talking about here is bacteria. Microbiome is really an ecosystem bacteria, about 39 trillion bacteria that lives in our gut, actually lives all over our body in every orifice, you know, your ears, your nose, your nostrils, your mouth, your anus. I mean, every place there's an opening, there's bacteria. But here's the crazy thing. Inside our body, we're packed with bacteria at the lower end of our gut. Okay. It's in an area that the most, the, the home, the great barrier reef of these natural bacteria in our body is in a part of the colon called the cecum, C-E-C-U-M. And if you're, you know, if you're in the medical field, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a part of the organ system that a lot of people aren't familiar with that term. Uh, Cause, you know, uh, I used to wonder like, okay, so where does a microbiome, where do all these bacteria live? It's called the cecum. All right. So. Uh, when I went to medical school, I was, you know, very quickly in the first week of school taught bacteria are bad and you're going to learn and memorize all the bacteria that are bad. And then you're going to actually take pharmacology and we're going to teach you about all the drugs, antibiotics that can be used to kill the bad bacteria. Right. And, and, you know, of course, even in kindergarten, we're always turned, wash your hands, get rid of the bacteria, you know, uh, uh, take a shower, all these kinds of messages about bacteria that have made us as a modern society um, shun, uh, maybe even be a little repelled by this idea of bacteria. Well, it turns out that that's, it's true. There are some bacteria that are really bad, bad actors, and they cause all kinds of problems. But by and large, most of the bacteria that we will encounter in our lives are inside our body, not outside our body. And most of the bacteria are good, not bad. And that's what we call our gut microbiome. Our gut microbiome actually is an ecosystem of 39 trillion bacteria, most of it living inside our gut. And what they do inside our gut is they um, they eat the food that our body doesn't digest. Let me explain. So you take a bite of, uh, of uh, an apple, all right? And our human bodies are going to absorb the natural fructose, the sugars in the, uh, in the apple. We're going to get the vitamins. We're actually going to get some of the other nutrients that are going to be absorbed into our body. But there's a lot of fiber that's going to be left over, right? You know, the the, the skin that you eat, if it's an organic apple, um, the fiber uh, from, there's a lot of fiber in apple or pear. And then that fiber trickles down your 40 feet of intestines all the way to the cecum. And the bacteria there you're feeding your bacteria, this leftover stuff. Whatever we don't absorb goes to the bacteria. I'm going to come back to that point because you're asking why are the chemicals not so good for us? It's because our bacteria get fed. But if it's normal healthy food, normal healthy fiber, our bacteria eats those that fiber and and in payback for feeding them, they the love that they, our bacteria show for us is they produce metabolites that are anti-inflammatory. These are called short-chain fatty acids or SCAFAs. Um, and they lower inflammation, they promote healing, they uh, streamline our blood lipids, they make our insulin sensitivity better, which is an important part of our metabolism. So the fuel is actually more rapidly absorbed into our bloodstream. You, nobody wants to have lots of glucose, lots of blood sugar at high levels all day long. And not good for our bodies, okay? It's like being stuck in a bathtub too long or a swimming pool too long. You know how your fingers wrinkle? That's not what you want. So you want your our blood sugar to be readily absorbed into our cells. Okay, those are these are just partially what we know our gut bacteria does for us. So we got to feed them well. Feeding them like three times a day is kind of like having a pet. Our bacteria, our microbiome is like a pet. If you have a dog, a cat, a parakeet, a goldfish... You know, most of us are responsible pet owners, so we make sure that we feed them our kibble or the flakes every single day or the seeds, right? Now, we most of us will choose what kind of food we're actually feeding our pet. You don't want to feed your dog crap, right? You want to choose carefully. You want to take care of your animal. Well, that's basically what eating whole uh, uh, foods uh, that are uh, as good as possible, high-quality whole foods, that's what we're feeding our gut microbiome, all right? Um, and, that, and they pay us back by giving us health through these short-chain fatty acids. Okay, let's go back to your question. What about foods that are laden with synthetic chemicals, artificial preservatives? Um, artificial sweeteners, by the way, is another big offender. All right. What happens is that we're feeding or we're eating it. Oh, there's no calories in an artificial sweetener. Uh, uh, oh, this uh, cheap shelf-stable stuff uh, with artificial flavor tastes really great. 
goes down the gullet, um, we absorb relatively little because it doesn't have as many nutrients as a, the normal whole food. The rest of it, where does it go? We don't just poop it out. We're feeding our gut bacteria, that 39 trillion uh, 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 population, and we're feeding them crap. We're feeding them chemicals. We're feeding them things that they shouldn't be eating. Okay. Imagine if you fed your pet dog, okay, really terrible quality food, chemical food all the time. I don't think your dog's going to last that long. Okay. All the problems that your vet tells you that the dogs, you know, can have if you feed them poor quality food. That's what we're doing to our gut with all these artificial synthetic things. And so that's the reason why we need to take good care. You know, like this whole idea of, um, the pregnant mom saying, I, I have to watch what I eat because I'm eating for two. Well, guess what? Each of us, we're eating for 39 trillion. In fact, we are feeding our gut microbiome and we have that responsibility. If we treat our gut microbiome well, they will treat our health well. I'm excited to share with you my favorite magnesium supplement, Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. Click the link in the description to save 10%. And now back to the show. Well, let's let's go into this further. Let's talk about two different angles here, one being the pesticides. Let's come back to that and, and talk about what happens when they get down there and how they affect the microbiome. And then two, what are things we can do on the other end? You know, we talked about fiber, but what are some of the things we can do to make sure our microbiome is thriving? Yeah. So first of all, what do some of the bad substances, the bad actors, the chemicals do? They kill off good bacteria. And when good bacteria get killed off, bad bacteria start to grow in. It's an ecosystem, right? So think about the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I've actually had the privilege of uh, swimming and diving and, and snorkeling around there. Amazing. You know, you're, you go into the water and you see this dizzying array of colorful sea life. If you start removing the moray eels and taking the crabs away and removing the clownfish and taking away the sea anemones, those are all critical players in the gut microbiome. What do you think is going to grow into that space? Something will grow into it. And in the case of our gut microbiome, it's the bad bacteria that replace the good bacteria. They overgrow. Okay. And when you got a lot of bad bacteria growing, they produce inflammatory compounds, not anti-inflammatory compounds. They start to create inflammation. And some of these bad bacteria, by the way, can drill their way through your healthy gut and even get into your bloodstream, which is really, really dangerous. In fact, there's one called C. diff, a Clostridium difficile, which is a big, deadly problem in the hospital that can cause terrible inflammatory changes in your gut. You got to be on IV antibiotics and, you know, some people don't make it when they have that kind of infection. So that's why, you know, overgrowth of bad bacteria is a terrible thing. We believe that a lot of um, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory gut disease, and even colon cancers and gut cancers are probably at least partly attributable to harmful overgrowth of bad bacteria. And that's just in the gut. We also know that when you have harmful bacteria growing in your gut, it raises the uh, chances of actually having heart disease, diabetes, and even Alzheimer's disease because of the gut-brain axis. There's a connection between the two. Bad actors in your gut cause bad consequences everywhere in your body. This is such a new, important field that we only understand the tip of the iceberg. And if I were advising a young uh, medical student going into their career right now, and they ask me, uh, hey, Dr. Lee, what kind of field, research field should I go into? I would say go study the microbiome. There's a whole vast frontier out there that teaches us how important our gut bacteria is for our health. So what are some of the th good things that you can actually do? We talked a lot about the bad things. I'm always about the positive side. Like, don't tell me about, don't tell me about just a problem if you can't give me a solution, right? So the solution is this. Feed our bacteria, our good gut bacteria, to restore their integrity. Help, help the good guys grow back, right? So think about it this way. You have a perfectly good neighborhood, and the uh, uh, some of the people, the residents there get older and older. They age out, um, and, and they die, and they move away. And now you've got gang members and drug dealers that move in. Okay, that's the overgrowth of bad bacteria. What do you think those drug dealers and, and gang members are going to do? They're going to attract more drug dealers and more bag, uh, more gang uh, uh, gang members into the community. And, well, there goes the neighborhood. And that's what happens when you have an overgrowth of this bad bacteria. So what do you do? How do you rehab a neighborhood? What's the good move? Well, look, you've got to move some of the bad guys out. That's for sure. But then what you want to do is you want to move lots of good guys back into the neighborhood because you can actually re rehab 
uh, a, a, a downtown neighborhood by moving it, by rehabbing the neighborhood, making the places nicer, putting, moving people in that deserve to be there, that can be good citizens. And how do we do that for our gut bacteria? We, we start eating more whole uh, plant-based foods. We eat fiber. We eat good bioactives. Uh, we eat the, the positive bioactives in whole foods. We cut down on the chemicals, synthetic chemicals, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors. We try to grow back the good guys, and the bad guys will start to go away because the good guys can overgrow. They can actually dominate if you give them the opportunity. And so what we do is we do we can eat three types of foods. Number one, we can eat prebiotic foods. These are foods with a lot of dietary fiber, broccoli, uh, 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 apples, uh, lots of fruits, uh, pears, uh, 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 mushrooms, uh, celery, kale, uh, lots of these green veggies, uh, red bell peppers, green peppers, uh, onions. They all contain lots of dietary fiber. Awesome. Great. Good for you. Um, uh, even uh, uh, bamboo shoots that you might get in an Asian market, for example. I was just thinking about that because I said I went to an Asian market the other day. Also, great way of getting dietary fiber. That's why pandas eat bamboo, by the way. Um, they get the dietary fiber. Good bacteria helps to grow. You can also eat bacteria itself. So bacteria in foods, again, you know, we were always told if you look in the if you look in your fridge and you see some blue stuff growing on your food, toss it out. True. Please do that. You don't want to be eat, getting food poisoning. But there are certain foods that have good bacteria in them. What kind of foods? Yogurt. It's got made with, uh, it's fermented with good bacteria. Kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, pickles, uh, all made with uh, good, healthy bacteria. Uh, and even some cheeses, which, you know, have a lot of saturated fat and salt, so not really healthy for you. Um, even some of the cheeses can actually have good bacteria that are actually growing. Sourdough bread. Um, uh, you know, I'm not telling people to eat a lot of carbs or eat a lot of um, bread, but if you're going to eat bread, sourdough, that tang, that characteristic flavor of sourdough bread is made by lactic acid. What kind? How do you get the lactic acid in sourdough bread? You have a good, healthy bacteria that should be growing in our gut called lactobacillus. Lactobacillus, lacto. Bacillus, ba 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 that kind of bacteria makes lactic acid, which makes sourdough taste tangy. The bacteria remnants are in that bread, and you eat them, you're actually replenishing your body by contributing to the ecosystem. And then, of course, there's something called um, postbiotics. And postbiotics are really whatever the bacteria produces, you know, can we actually add some of that into our system as well? Well, it turns out a, a, a jar of pickles or a jar of kimchi or a jar of sauerkraut already has postbiotics because the bacteria are already in there and they're already making their stuff. So we're already eating some of that good stuff. And I think that's really the thing to do. Stay away from the bad things for your for your gut microbiome. Add some of the good things for your gut uh, microbiome. One last point about this is that how does, what makes our gut microbiome happy, uh, happiest? It turns out it's not just plant-based foods, but diversity. If you eat the same damn thing every single day, your gut bacteria gets really bored and doesn't like it. So try to eat 20 or 30 different kinds of plant-based foods every week, all right? Not that hard to do. Spices count. You, you know, put some uh, a seasoning on there. It might be four or five plant-based foods already. In a salad, use more than romaine lettuce. Put different kinds of greens in there. Light them up. You know, uh, uh, diversity is what, your our gut microbiome thrives on. And so this is where I think that this idea of loving your food and loving your health come into play. This is not about being a robot and following only one or two foods and you got to eat a lot of it all the time. But you know, look at all these foods. I write about more than 200 foods I need to beat disease. All of them come from traditional food traditions that you can combine and make absolutely delicious and tasty. So that's actually how you get this diversity, which your gut microbiome will thank you for by um, having more diverse foods means more diverse bacteria, which means a healthier microbiome, which means an overall healthier body. For somebody tuning in who's realizing, okay, this is all great, but I've been abusing my microbiome for my life up until this point, maybe through artificial sweeteners, um, antibiotics, pesticides on produce. What I'm getting at here is, is there good research showing that if we include this fiber in these fermented foods and we don't have a good microbiome to start, 
did they, did these bacteria we're taking in, did they actually seed and stay there or how, how does that work? Yeah. So it's not a single bacteria. It's really the response of the ecosystem. And it turns out that if you eat um, a healthy food, like a kiwi, for example, that has a lot of dietary fiber, your it will cause your gut microbiome to grow healthy bacteria within 24 hours. So it doesn't take much to actually start the process of rehab going. And that's really what we're talking about. It's a process. And of course, you do want to actually cut down or cut out the bad stuff because if you're just, if you're just shoveling in harmful things to your gut microbiome, like it, you're not giving it a chance to recover. You want to back off the bad stuff, start the good stuff. And it's pretty quick. Actually, you can actually usually get um, a replenishment of your gut microbiome. These days, by the way, Jesse, you can actually order out and send out your stool sample to have your own gut microbiome checked. So things actually, you know, we're beginning, it's not, it's not mainstream yet. And maybe some of the tests aren't quite ready for prime time, but it's a really, really useful way for us to be able to monitor our own health by looking for those healthy gut bacteria. Oh, that's great. And I just want to make sure what I'm getting at specifically though, is the assumption that there is still, even if we've abused the microbiome, certain seeds and bits of the good bacteria that when we put the right stuff in, those bloom and, and take up adequate space like they should? Or is it actually bacteria that are coming off the fermented food uh, or just you know bacteria in our, in our environment that we're taking in that are repopulating from ground zero? It's, it's actually all a little bit of all of the above. So it's the good bacteria getting an edge once again to grow back and fill up the spot that they want to fill up. It's the good bacteria that you're eating in the foods that are eventually that you're eating with some of the bacteria. By the way, kimchi, by the way, has two bacteria that have been discovered, newly discovered, like new to the biology world that is present only in kimchi. I, I was really absolutely surprised. I'm not Korean, but I, but I do like kimchi. And one of them is actually uh, fights influenza. It actually... Uh, is a bacteria that actually resist, helps us fight the flu. And another one actually helps us improve our metabolism. And so there are these unique bacteria that grow in foods that are actually really good for us. And so, yes, we want to be able to eat some of those and they stick and they grow. Um, our, the ones that are good already can actually grow back and expand more. And of course, we're being in contact with bacteria all the time anyway in our environment. Um, you know, one, one of the things we're starting to realize is that being living in a sterile environment, not so good for us. We, we need to be participating in our planet, which is not so much as a dirty planet. I mean, well, maybe it is a dirty planet, but basically we need to actually uh, be in contact with, we need to be at one with the different kinds of bacteria out there. So you got a kid, let them play in the dirt a little bit. They're actually getting some good bacteria from the planet uh, to help uh, keep their gut, keep challenging their gut to making sure it's in good shape. And Dr. Lee, I know you're all about food first, which makes a lot of sense to me, but how do you feel about layering on with the fiber, with the fermented foods, a good probiotic? Oh, well, look, probiotics are, I, I mean, I take probiotics. I, I, I believe in them. A probiotic um, is really a mix, tends to be a mix of bacteria that we're just adding to the, the good guys that are in our gut. I don't think a probiotic should be a replacement, however, to fibrous foods, you know, the prebiotic foods of the probiotic foods, because you get so much more, right? So this is what you call, um, you know, the pure bacteria. Yeah, probably helpful. I, I believe in it. But I, I, you know, you get so much more from those healthy bioactives that are present in the whole food. And that's actually what I want people to kind of focus on is what are the whole foods that you really enjoy? You know, this isn't a chore. This is all about, you know, enjoying your health and enjoying your food at the same time. You, you can actually pick from a menu of foods that are actually good for you. Don't eat the ones you don't like, for God's sake. Choose the ones that you actually love and pick lot you know, different ones and, and vary it up. Enjoy it. Like I, I, I really try to um, coach people into not being afraid of food, but leaning into food, not worrying so much about the things that can harm them. But really focusing on which foods that you enjoy can actually bring you benefit because that's a win-win situation when you find a food that you enjoy and it's good for you. You touched on the fact that our microbiome is in communication with different areas of the body. I want to hone in on the communication between the gut and the brain. Hmm. This is something that you know comes up on the show periodically, but 
you're a guy that likes to go deep into the science. So I'm curious, how does that work? You know, it's so interesting because we don't fully understand it, but I'll tell you what we believe is happening. Um, okay, let me set the stage by first painting a picture of how the gut and the brain is is wired together. Okay, so out of our brain, we've got nerves that come out of our brain. Our brain is like tens of millions of nerves, but there are these cranial nerves that pop out like um, – uh, like wires coming out of the wall. And one of them, the, one of the biggest nerves is called the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S. It's the one of the biggest nerves in the body. Comes out of your head, runs down your neck, wraps around your esophagus, which is the, the tube that we eat with, to our stomach. And then below that, it, 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 it um, branches out into thousands of branches. Those branches reach all the way down to our intestines. And it's kind of like um, a horse's tail in the blowing in the wind. You've got all these tendrils everywhere, and they're touching our gut. And what we believe is that the brain signals to the gut through these nerves that talk to the bacteria, and vice versa, the bacteria can send a text message up to the brain through the vagus nerves. Okay, so you think about the bacteria living inside your gut. There's a gut wall, and then just on the other side is a is a wire, and the bacteria can actually just put a signal right through the wire. Uh, so this is a wired system, not a wireless system, and it goes up into the brain. Um, and of course, the bacteria can also send wireless signals by, through the bloodstream. And then what happens is that when the brain receives those bacterial signals, they begin to release hormones, social hormones being one of the most important. There's one called oxytocin. Some of you, your, your viewers and listeners may have heard of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a social hormone. It is the hormone that your brain surges and releases when you see a great friend that you haven't seen for a long time. Like, oh my God, I feel so good being, seeing that person. Or when you um, give a family member a hug, you know, a family member you like a hug, um, you know, it, you, you feel good. That's oxytocin. Oxytocin is what you actually get, um, not with a, not with a peck on the lips with a kiss, but a French kiss, your brain floods out oxytocin. And the, and the biggest example everyone always remembers when I say this is that when you have an orgasm, your brain pounds out a gigantic burst of oxytocin. It's just there for a few seconds, but that's what makes you feel so great for a short period of time. Okay. The gut microbiome is connect, is co communicating through this vagus nerve up into your brain. And triggering, sending text messages, hey, a little oxytocin, please, a little more oxytocin, please. And so it actually helps us keep our mood going up. That's an example. Oxytocin is just one of them. Serotonin, dopamine. These are all the things that psychiatrists are writing prescriptions for for decades to try to improve mood. You know, I think that we're beginning to realize that our gut bacteria actually plays a role in improving our mood. Now we're beginning to think, or I should say rethink, how we actually approach um, uh, improving somebody's mood disorders. How do we get people to feel better? Uh, I mean, even after surgery or hospitalization or um, you know a bereavement, like, are there ways we can actually treat our gut microbiome better that will actually make us recover, feel better, uh, sort of on a mental and emotional state as well. So that gut brain axis goes way more deeply and profoundly than, than, uh, than that, than, than, um, you know, just simply communicating back and forth. It actually influences who we are, our identity. Furthermore, the gut brain axis seems to help to, um, influence whether or not we're going to de develop dementia or Alzheimer's disease. All right. You know, th this is an epidemic, right? Like the dementia in an aging population. And it's been so difficult to find drugs that can actually improve Alzheimer's disease. Could the answer partly be by improving the gut microbiome? Actually, I happen to think so. And so this is another really exciting area of research that we cannot ignore. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. So while it's very important to know how to choose the right foods, it's equally important to know what foods we want to be cautious of, wary, and cut down or cut out or avoid altogether. We're feeding our gut bacteria.